In honor of Father's Day, we teach our children how to use an oven the right way. Yeah. All right. So um, we're going to start today by the scriptures. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet in honor of God's word. We're going to start with scriptures. And then uh, my joke story, it's actually a, a story. So um, that sort of fits in with what I'm going today. So you all right with doing the scriptures first? All right, anybody else like me, you're like tired of rain and clouds. Is there anybody in the room you're like really tired of this? And you would just like to have sunshine and warmth. Anybody other than me? All right, yeah. Um, I, I guess it's just me. My head's clogged up. I'm not thinking clearly. I feel like I'm in a fog. So can we, can we do ourselves a favor, even before we approach the scriptures, can we just ask God, to give us clarity of thought and a mind today that in the space this morning, our hearts would be open to what he would say to us. Can we just do that? Okay, God. Um, there are 50,000 things competing for our attention. We, we've all got phones going off, people around us. There's cool things on the platform to look at. There's all kinds of things, just competing for our attention, thoughts about what we did yesterday, what we're going to do today. And God, those things competing for our attention, I pray that right now we would subject them to your lordship and we would listen to what you have to say. I believe this message today can transform people's futures. And I pray that in the name of Jesus, we would be open to hear your truth and your word to us today so that we could step into what you have for us. God, help me to say what needs to be said the way it needs to be said so that we can hear it, and I pray our hearts would be open in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so Matthew, Mark chapter 12, verse 28, it's on the screen, and if you would, one of the teachers of the law came and heard him debating, noticing that Jesus had given him a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Could you all read this with me? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Y'all, only about four people did that with me. Come on, everybody, you gotta do it with me, all right? Can we do this together? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Yeah, there you go. And go ahead to the next slide and read with me as well. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. You can just stop right there. That's it. And then... He said, well, well said, teacher, the man replied, and you're right in saying that there is God is one and there's no other but him. And uh, you're right to say that we should love him with all of our heart, with all of our understanding, with all of our strength and love our neighbors ourselves. It's more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And I love this next line. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. There's one other thing I want to point out. I'm going to point it out again is that having the right head knowledge about a relationship with God does not get you in the kingdom of God. It puts you close to it. This man had all the right answers, but he was not in the kingdom. He was not far from the kingdom. There is a place that we need to journey to where we step into faith, not just into a knowledge of what the truth is, but actual an acceptance of what the truth is. So thanks God for hearing our prayer and I pray that you've been blessed by this and thank you for participating with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. All yeah, all right, God bless you, may be seated. So in a Texas town out west, there was an oil rig, one oil rig in the town. And my wife makes fun of me for how I say oil. It's oil, oil. That's an Oklahoma Southern boy, oil. So anyway, there was an oil rig in town, and it was a source of income for the town, and it was very highly prized. Well, one day, the oil rig caught fire, 
and they couldn't figure out how to put out the fire that threatened their livelihood and the future of their town. So they didn't have the money to bring in some professional firefighter because it's a small town, one rig. So what they did was they offered $2,000 to anyone who could successfully quench the flames. This was a long time ago. One rig, 2,000 bucks was a lot of money. Immediately, an unpretentious young farmhand applied for the job and promised to make his attempt early the next morning. So the next morning, nearly everyone in town turned out to see this young man coming over the hill in his pickup truck with all of his friends and family and everybody he could load gathered on one big pickup. Have y'all ever seen that? It's amazing. All these people on one pickup and they're coming over the hill and this truck's going, going, going. All of a sudden it, it just, it's not stopping and, and it just keeps running, running, running. Boom, smashes into the oil well and all the people in the truck hop out and start stomping the flames of the oil that's gotten on them and the fire. And as, a couple of seconds later, the fire's all out. And they all gathered around the young man. They're like, this was so awesome. This is so awesome. What are you going to do with all this money? And he says, well, the first thing I'm going to do is fix the brakes on my truck. <laughs> do you ever feel that way that you're trying to help, but your brokenness just gets in the way? Your brokenness is what keeps you from actually moving ahead with life. And you feel like your brokenness puts you in situations that you're always stamping out some flame. Anybody there other than me this week? All right. Five of us. The rest of you. You're perfect. You can just go home. So today is Father's Day. And I, I'm not going to preach the whole sermon about Father's Day. But I want to say a couple of things to guys real quick. Number one. I believe in our culture, men are under attack. I believe masculinity is under attack. I could give you multiple examples, but I read an article last night about a guy simply saying he was in, actually it was a mom saying that her teenage boys was in a worship service and the girl in front of her was wearing, the, the girls in front of them were wearing the, the yoga pants. And the mom said, it was really hard for my kids to focus on worshiping God in the house of God because the girl in front of them, their butts were hanging out. And the mom got tore up on social media. Things like, well, they're rapists in their own minds because they're guys. And I'm listening to all this stuff and I'm thinking, why can't we simply say this? Okay, all right, ladies, ladies. It's not negative for me to say, if I'm an alcoholic and I got a problem drinking and I come over to your house, please don't offer me a drink. Come on. Come on. Preach it. And could you please, it's loving to be kind to guys. I'm reading this article though, and my point is not to go off on that subject. My, my point is simply to say this, that the belittling of men was amazing to me. Any, anybody watched a TV show recently where a father figure is actually a hero that does things right? Anybody seen one of those in the last 20 years? Even the ones where the father figure is semi-sane, he's the one that's the biggest goof up. Am I correct? Why? Do you know, I, I'm all for equality for women, but I believe something's going on in our culture here, and this is what's going on in our culture is that there is an undermining of masculinity in an attempt to control men. And it's going to backfire. And it is backfiring. And divorce rates are going to keep going up if we keep belittling men. So guys, I want to encourage you. I don't care what culture says about you. I want to encourage you to be a man. Be a man of character. Be a man of strength. And I'll show you one more way that I know culture is destroying, trying to destroy mas masculinity. Did anybody grow up in the 80s? Anybody really alive in the 80s? Do you remember Pee Wee? Anybody remember Pee Wee? How did Pee Wee dress? I got a picture of Pee Wee. I got a picture. That's how Pee Wee dressed and we made fun of him in the 80s. By, by the way, right now, if you go to buy a suit for a man anywhere, guess what you're getting? They're trying to turn us into a joke. Skinny jeans and super tight, boyish. Listen, I'm a man and my armpits sweat. I don't need to wear something like that. 
So all that's to say this. I, I believe men need the right to be men. God made you to be men. Your testosterone is higher than women. That means we will be more aggressive than women. It's all right. Fathers, you will make mistakes because you're more aggressive. My kids fell. I was like, get up. You ain't hurt. Right? And, and I'm going to preach sermon on this later. I'm going to preach sermon series. But I, I think we're doing damage to a whole generation by giving them bicycle helmets. We, we got to protect them from everything. They got to wear elbow pads now. Come on. I used to ramp my bike off of bricks and rocks and wood with no helmet and ramping, trying to do tricks in the air. We hurt things a lot. And somehow I survived. And do you know that kids right now live with more stress than people who were in mental institutions in the 1950s? Do you know why they live with more stress? Because we've taken fathers out of the the equation and we've tried to overprotect everything. Guys, it's all right for you to be different and for you to be a guy. And somebody ought to say amen. I, I really didn't mean to go off on all that. I have real simple notes there. But I, I just think we're trying to emasculate masculinity in an attempt to control men. So, so I, I am all for equality. and I believe if the lady does an equal job, she should get equal pay. Right? I believe every opportunity available to a man, including preaching the gospel, is available to a woman. And I can back that up scripturally. If you've got problems with that, let's have a debate. I'll kick your butt. I believe all those things are true, but we are not to sacrifice masculinity on the altar of equality. God created you to be who he created you to be. And I believe that God made every one of us, man, woman, teen, child, black, white, oriental, Hispanic, young, old, good looking, or not so good looking. (laughs) I'm joking. That's a lie. Anyway, um, to honor God with our lives. God made all of us, no matter who we are, to honor God with our lives. In fact, the highest praise you can give to God is to be the best you that God made you to be. You say, how in the world does this fit into this message today? Well, in Mark chapter 12, verse 31... We are commanded to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second commandment is to love your neighbor. Everybody say these last two words. Love your neighbor as yourself. So before you can really love God right, and before you can really love your neighbor right, you have to first learn to love yourself. Now, when I say that, I know there are guards that go up in some of your mind. And I just want to tell you that there's a difference between loving yourself and narcissism. Thinking about yourself more does not make you love yourself more. Because some of the most narcissistic people I've ever met who think about themselves all the time have no real self-love. Because self-love is not thinking about yourself more. Self-love is actually thinking about yourself less and understanding that God made you to be who God made you to be, not always spending all of your mental energy trying to figure out how you can get more pleasure out of your world. So love is rooted in valuing and caring for health, both your spiritual health, your physical health, your emotional health, your social health. Narcissism is rooted in selfish pursuit of desire, your pleasure, your ego, your control of others. And this tension is a tension we live with. I'll tell you a little story. I read it in this book right here, Lead Like Jesus. I'm I'm reading about four books right now, and they're all sort of messing with me, and they're all saying the same thing. It's amazing how I get all these books sort of jump into my life at the same time because I am so ADHD. I cannot read a book and finish it. I have to read four books at the same time and finish them all somewhere around the same time. It's horrible. It's wonderful. What's amazing is I can't tell you the number of times I've read multiple books that all say the same thing at the same time. But one of the things this is talking about is how our ego gets in the way. And E-G-O stands for edging God out. Ego means you edge God out. And one of the things it was telling was a story about um, 
a guy you might have heard of named Abraham Lincoln. And one night, it was a Saturday night, Abraham Lincoln was in his, in his room, and there was a colonel, and the colonel's name was Colonel um, Scott. He was a commander of the troops guarding the Capitol there in Washington. And Scott's wife had drowned in a steamship collision in the Chesapeake Bay. And this uh, Colonel Scott had gone to his regimental command and asked for a leave of absence to attend his wife's funeral. And he was turned down. So then he took his request to the Secretary of War, and he was turned down. Because his job was so important that he couldn't go to his wife's funeral. So finally, in an ultimate act of desperation, Scott went to Abraham Lincoln on a Saturday night, goes into his room, knocks on his door, and, and makes his request. And this is how Lincoln, in his narcissistic moment, replied. He said, am I to have no rest? Is there no hour or spot where I can escape these constant calls? Why do you follow me here with such business as this? Why do you not go to the war office where they have charge of all the matters, papers, and transportation? Scott told Lincoln of the refusals, and he replied with equal fervor that he should not be disturbed because he had things to do, and he could not take the time for every little request. Boy, what a jerk. What was he thinking about? What was Abraham Lincoln thinking about in that moment? Himself. Everything was about him. That is not self-love. The next morning, Abraham Lincoln woke up, and as he always did, he opened the scriptures early in the morning and bowed his knee. And apparently God said, uh, 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 because before breakfast, he was knocking on Colonel Scott's door and granted him the right to go to his wife's funeral because when he pressed into the presence of God and stopped thinking about himself, he got his view of his world right. Our problem is this. You ready? We want to go to Facebook, and we want to go to Instagram, and we want to go to our little corner where we think about ourselves more, and we get our pity party going. Anybody ever had a pity party? And the more you pity party, the less you experience God's love, and the less you experience God's love, the less you are to know how much you are loved and valued, and therefore you do not share that love with other people. We have a problem in our culture, and our problem is this, is that we want to tell everybody what to do, but nobody wants to go to God and listen to what God is saying to do. Yeah. So, I want to give you three simple statements about self-love. Number one, God loves you. God loves us all. God loves us, and he loves you so much. How was Jesus able to be as secure as he was? How was Jesus able to do and say the things he did? He did so because he was secure in his Father's love. We'll talk about what those actions led to later, but let's look. Remember Matthew 3, 17, before Jesus had performed a miracle, before Jesus had ever preached a sermon, before anything happened, Matthew 3, 17, God said to him, a voice came from heaven, this is my son whom I love, I love him. With him, I'm well pleased. Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. Listen to him. So twice in Jesus' life, a voice appeared from heaven and told God spoke directly that he loved his son. He loved his son. God's love to Jesus, and Jesus' acceptance of that love was the very root of everything Jesus did in this life. But you know what? God makes some statements about you. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us, for you. God demonstrated his love for you in this, that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. You didn't have to do anything for God to love you. You didn't have to get it right. You didn't have to live a perfect life. You didn't have to uh, make all the right big moves and accomplish and be great for God to love you because God loves you just as you are. God, everybody should say that. God loves me just as I am. God loves you just as you are. Now, he may want you to get better, right? Anybody have kids? Anybody have kids? Do you love them? Yes. 
Do you wish they would change some stuff? Yes. Okay. So you know what it's like to love somebody just as they are, all the while wishing for something better for them. Am I correct? All right, then why can't God love you just as you are? Why can't he love you just as you are? And, and you know what? He wants to work through the things that are your problems. But the first thing you need to understand is those working through your problems don't come from him being mad at you or hating you or not liking you. It comes from love for you because God loves me even while I'm still a sinner. God loves you just as you are. He loves you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, because of this, God's great love for us. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even while we were still dead in our transgressions. So while you were not doing anything right, God still loves you, and he's reaching out to you in love and mercy. My only question is, will you receive this love, or will you keep your view of yourself? God wants you to accept his love for you, period. How do you accept it? It's very simple. Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is my Lord, and you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's how you can receive God's love. And what you're doing there is you're saying, all right, I know you have a view of me, and I know you want things for me, and I know that you have a plan for me. I'm going to do this. I believe it, and I'm going to confess it. And when I confess it, my confession is, you are Lord, I'm not, I receive all of your good plans for me. There's a quote from another book I'm reading. It said, living and swimming in the river of God's deep love for us in Christ is at the very heart of true spirituality. Soaking in this love enables us to surrender to God's will, especially when it seems so contrary to what we see and what we feel or what we figure out for ourselves. This experiential knowledge of God's love and acceptance provides the only sure foundation for loving and accepting our true selves. Only the love of God in Christ is capable, only the love of God in Christ is capable of bearing the weight of our true identity. Bearing the weight of our true identity. You have a true identity. And that's what I want to talk about, is letting God's love Define your true identity. So the second thing is, second statement I want to make is let God's love define you. Let God's love define you. Now, we all have a false self that destroys our true potential. And then there's a true self in us. So the story was, um, it was in the movie Amadeus. Anybody see that movie? I didn't. I read books about things. I don't read books. My wife says, why would you ruin a perfectly good movie with a book? I'm a why would you ruin a perfectly good book with a movie. Notice the two different ways. So I read books about things. She watches the movie. Anyway, Amadeus is a movie. And in this movie, there was a, a court musician named Antonio Salarini. Antonio Salarini was a great musician in his own right. He was a, a fabulous musician and he performed. But there was this other guy in the court you might have heard of named Mozart. Anybody ever hear of Mozart? Now, Mozart had the rare ability, very few people have, he had the ability to compose a, 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 a symphony in his head before he put it on paper. He was amazing. He was just an amazing guy. And, and this Salarini, who was a good musician in his own right, did not enjoy his life, but lived in envy because he wasn't as good as Mozart. Anybody ever know anybody like that? They're good enough to be good, to play on the team, but they're never happy because they're not the all-star. Or somebody that makes a living and they live in a nice neighborhood and drive a nice car, but it's not enough because you want to have somebody else's house in somebody else's car or somebody else's husband. You, do you guys know what I'm saying? Are anybody identifying with this? God's given us blessings, but we're not satisfied with those blessings because we want what somebody else has. And what happens when we do that is we live a life of envy. Instead of living our lives, we're envious that we don't have someone else's lives. So what we need is real spiritual and emotional health. So here are a couple of questions to help you. These are questions I've been reading. Oh, man, these hurt. First one is, when you pray... 
Do you just regurgitate a list of give me's or do you ever tell God what you're really thinking? That's a scary thought to tell God what you're really thinking. You know what you're really thinking? That part you don't even want to admit yourself? That I'm jealous? Any, any, all right, so I'm a pastor. Can I, can I be really just, can I just remove the junk this morning? I'm a pastor. And uh, I pastor uh, a church that is, in the world's view, in competition with other churches. Believe it or not, there have been times over the years that I've heard of somebody else's problems as a pastor, their problems as a church, and you know what, I, you know what the first thought that comes to my head is? No, you, you don't want to hear this. Good, maybe some of their people will come over here. No, no, seriously. How sick is that? Right? How sick is that? Anybody, anybody ever, like, you're on a sports team and the person who's starting in front of you gets hurt and you're like, yay, I get my chance now. Or you're on a job and somebody goose up a project and you're like, yeah, maybe they'll listen to me now. Anybody ever have those thoughts? Yeah. Oh, those are sick thoughts. Because here's the deal. We have envy inside of us and true love doesn't live in that world. So when you're praying... It is an amazing thing for you to pray and say, God, I am a jerk. <laughs> Please forgive me for that. And to tell them that envy that's within me, that bad stuff that's within me, would you be honest with them about it? Or when you pray, is it more like, give me, give me, give me, Lord, give me, give me, give me. Is that the way you pray or do you actually tell God what you're thinking, what you're feeling? You're disappointed in someone and you tell them about that disappointment. You're disappointed in yourself and you start talking to them about why you're doing it. Most of us do not pray like we really, really have a relationship with God. Most of us make our devotions more about telling God what we want getting out in the door. And what God wants to have is a dialogue with you. And part of spiritual and emotional health and living in God's love and letting him define you is for you to be honest in prayer about what really bugs you. Second question. What makes you puff? And what makes you get angry? What makes you puff? You know what puff is, don't you? You know what, you know what that is? Somebody's telling a story, and you tell, break into their story to tell a bigger story? What makes you, when somebody says something to you, that, that you, you got to tell something bigger or look bigger? Or, or one day I walked back through the schools of my high school, and uh, I found myself walking like this. What makes you do that? What makes you uh, fix somebody else's story for them? What makes you puff? Why do you puff? Have you ever asked yourself a question, why do I do that? I, I, I will just give you a real, it's your insecurity that you don't believe you're important. But watch it this week. Ask yourself a question, what makes you puff? Ask yourself another question. What makes me angry? What makes me angry? What makes you mad and why do you get mad about it? What makes you mad and why do you get mad about it? No, don't just ask that. Most of us, we get mad about stuff and we just sort of gloss over it, get, get mad, pitch our little fit, but we never ask the question, why did them leaving their shoes in the middle of the hallway make me so mad? Because <laughs> they don't belong there, that's why. No, no ask yourself questions, why? You, God wants to talk about those things with you. Here's one more question for you. After three days with your family of origin, what age do you behave at? Oh, my goodness. I found myself acting 13 one time. Why did I do that? Why did I go back to 13? Why? Because I was still a little kid. Even though I was 30 years old, I was still a kid acting like I was 13 in my parents' house. Why? Why? See, these are questions we need to ask because I am convinced. You ready? Y'all ready? If you don't pay attention to another thing I say, listen to this. I am convinced that most of us never grow spiritually because we refuse to let God help us grow emotionally. God did not make you to love the Lord your God with all your heart. How 
how did he make you? To love him with all your heart, soul, your mind, and your strength. All of you, not just part of you. So if you're only developing one part of your relationship with God, you're not growing because you can't like only do biceps. If you do, your back will give out. Are y'all following me? God wants you to do all of your spiritual growth. So the difference between Christians, and this is my problem. Man, I'm, I'm, I said this was going to be a fast sermon today. Do you know most Christians and people in the world act basically the same? The only difference is what we do one hour a week, two or three times a month, and the guilt and shame we feel for doing all the other stuff. And if your Christianity is nothing more than an hour a week, two or three times a month, and feeling guilty about the bad things you do, you are missing the relationship with God. If it's just about you feeling guilty for doing wrong and for showing up and throwing $10 in the plate, then you are missing what God has for you. What God wants is for you not to be a carbon copy of the world just with a little guilt. God wants you to learn to love yourself so that you can be a light and example to the entire world. Philippians 1.9, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound. When's the last time you prayed this prayer? <laughs> this is my prayer. God, let my love abound more and more. You see, what God wants you to do is he wants you to know his love more so that you can walk in his love more so that you can share his love more. God wants you to live in his love, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and you may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. And notice it all starts, this best and this pure and this blameless and this life of purpose all starts with a knowledge of the love of God in your heart. This inside, inside life will find its way out. Anybody ever have a jack-in-the-box? I search for a jack. I guess they don't make jack-in-the-boxes anymore. We searched for them. We were looking. At, I should ask you yesterday. We needed a jack-in-the-box today. Does anybody know what a jack-in-the-box does? You take jack-in-the-box, you shove them down the box, you close the lid. And then you go, do 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 Pop. Out pops jack. And Jack comes out and he screams at us all again, right? Because, and then what do we do? We shove Jack back down in the box. We play a little more music and Jack always pops up. Why is that? Because this is what we do emotionally. We have anger. We have tension. We have self-doubt. We have fear. We have all of these things. We shove it down, shove it down, shove it down, shove it down. Life plays, 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 plays. Ah! You have a panic attack. Ah! I go crazy on somebody. I punch somebody in the face. I scream. I yell. I drop the F-bomb on my wife. I can't believe that these things happen. Why do they happen? Because I keep shoving down life's issues and the world keeps playing the tune and I will pop out at some point. What's inside you will pop out at some point. You do realize that, right? So God doesn't say, feel guilt and clean up the outside, God says the first thing you do is you clean the inside with his love, and then what pops out of you in those moments will be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, right? Our Christianity is not a do-good religion. It is a let God's love wash your soul, faith in God, so that he cleanses you on the inside. So what pops out in those moments is the love of Jesus Christ, not your own tension and brokenness. All right. Number three. No, I'm not ready for number three yet. I still got a lot to go on number two. Hope y'all are ready to stay a while. All right. Jesus was defined by his father's love. Now, there's this verse. It's in John chapter 13, verse 3, and it says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God, so he got up. Now, I love this passage. This is a passage where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And, and the disciples' feet, you know, they're all covered with exhaust from the streets of Jerusalem. Right? You know what exhaust from the streets of Jerusalem is, don't you? The, not just dirt, the exhaust from all the animals. So what's on their feet? Yeah, dogs run around the street. Where do dogs leave their exhaust? In the middle of the road. Anybody, right? Horses, cows, oxen, sheep, right? The disciples have been walking around in the exhaust of the day. It was time to eat dinner. 
and they go to lay down to eat dinner because they're reclining and their feet are sticking up in somebody else's face and they're like, "Woo! I don't care what we eat and it's not going to taste good. My olfactory nerves are not working right. Anybody ever had that happen? You eating a good meal, but the smell just overwhelms you from somewhere else? So here they are. The lowest slave in the house was the one that was supposed to get up. The lowest slave was the one that was supposed to wash the feet. So guess what Jesus did? Because he knew, because notice this, because he knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning from God. So he knew who he was, he knew why he was there, he knew where he came from, and he knew where he was going. Do you hear that security? Most of us, we don't know where we came from, really. We don't know where we're going. And most of us don't really know who we are in God's sight. So we don't act like Jesus did. We're always saying, somebody ought to wash them feet. And what did Jesus do? Because Jesus had an inward understanding of the love and purposes of God for his life. He got up from the meal and washed his disciples' feet. He washed the poop off their feet because he was the Lord of the universe and knew who he was on the end inside so he could serve everybody. You know why we don't serve people? We don't know who we are. If you want to change your actions, you have to change your identity first. And your identity is rooted in the love of God. So because of his knowledge of the love of God, he had the confidence to serve. Jesus also had the confidence to disappoint people. Anybody ever disappoint people? Do you know you're going to disappoint somebody? Can we just come to grips with this? I am going to disappoint somebody. The other day, I'm talking to a group of people, and my wife called on the phone. Do you know what I said? I'm sorry, our conversation has to stop. She's more important than you are. And I answered her. Why do I answer my wife in those moments? Because who is the most important person on this earth to me? My wife. So who will I disappoint, you or her? I will disappoint you because she's first. Do y'all get that? You're going to have to disappoint somebody at some point in time. God wants you to disappoint the right people. Who did Jesus disappoint? Well, Jesus had confidence, so he disappointed his family, Mark 3, 21. He disappointed the people of Nazareth, his hometown, in Luke chapter 4, verse 28. He disappointed the crowds in John 6, 66. Imagine that. He disappointed the religious leaders in Luke 19, 47. He disappointed his closest friends in Luke 23, 49. You see, Jesus disappointed all kinds of people, but he chose to disappoint the right people. So uh, there's this picture of Everest. I'm not sure if you guys know that there have been five people that died in the last several weeks trying to climb Everest. There's this mountain, and can you see them going up the hill, how they're going up there? And there's like a line to get up there. And, and people prepare, and they work, and they work, and they prepare, and they prepare, and they work, and they work, and they climb this mountain, and they climb the highest mountain in the world, and they're like, yes, that's awesome. Well, five people, because of the lines are so long, and it takes so long, five people died within the last couple of weeks trying to get up this mountain. And I want to know what was said in their funeral. Did anybody in their funeral say, they were such an awesome mountain climber? Do you think their wife or their kids were saying about them, oh, they were the best mountain climber ever? Do you think maybe that there was some regret that they died trying to climb the wrong mountain rather than trying to climb the mountain of being a great father? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say that out loud? Do you think maybe there were some people that expressed regret that maybe their potential in life was ruined because they were climbing the wrong mountain? I'm not saying you shouldn't climb the Everest of this world, and I'm not saying there aren't risks, but let me ask you a question. Well, in Seven Habits of Highly Affected People, there's a, there's a line there about people climbing the ladder of success to get to the top only to realize their ladder's against the wrong wall. Are you climbing the right walls? Are you climbing the right success? Are you listening? All right, so last thing. God's promises to help. God promises that he will help you do this work. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, he who began a good work in you will carry it on until the day of Christ Jesus. 
But you need, God promises, he's confident, you can be confident that God's going to complete his work. But you need to do your part. In Philippians 2, 12 and 13, it says, My dear friends, as you've always obeyed, work not only in my presence, now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to act and according to fulfill his purpose. So if you're going to fulfill God's purpose, you've got to learn that he, he will accomplish his purpose in your life. But you're going to have to work. And you're going to have to fear and tremble. I think this is a great balancing act in our life believing god says we will win but yet us doing the work that is necessary to win it's a great balancing act it's like a toll booth anybody ever have a problem in your life that just stops you dead in your tracks is that a a, a roadblock or a toll booth Do you all know the difference in a road, roadblock and a toll booth a, a, a dead end road, roadblock, you pull up to it, you can't go any further. You've got to turn around and go a different direction. But are the problems and issues we face with us in our world, they're, through Christ Jesus, they're not roadblocks. They're simply toll booths. You have to stop at a toll booth, but what do you do at a toll booth? You pay and then you go on. And there are a lot of things in your life that when you hear, you know, I'm broken or I failed or I did this wrong or that wrong or the other thing, God promises that he will complete his work in you, but you got to stop and pay the toll and you got to keep moving on. All right, so I'm going to finish. I, I, I'm going to finish just, I hold right here a crisp new $20 bill. Y'all see this? If I were to take this to the bank and I would ask for change, they would probably give me what? Either a $20 bill or 10s or 1s or whatever. But how many would they give me? 20? 20? 10, $10 bill and two fives, right? All right. So, all right. Now, if I take this to the bank, now that it's all broken up and wrinkled, uh, what do you think they give me? $18? Give me, but, it, but it's been through a tough time. It's been wrinkled up and messed up. It's been spit on now. What's it worth? 16 bucks? 16? What's it, what's it worth? 16? It's worth 20? But it's been wrinkled up, spit on. It's been stomped on. What's it worth now? What? It's not worth 14? Hold on, hold on. It's been through some stuff. It's worth less, right? Because its value is not set by what it goes through. Its value is set by the value that's placed on it from outside of itself. You listen to me. I don't care what you go through. Your value is not set by what you've been through. Your value is set by the God who loves you and has a plan and a purpose for your life. And it doesn't matter what this world does to you. Your value is set by God. So will you receive his value for you? Will you receive his love? Father, I pray that today our hearts would be open and we would receive your love and let your love define us not what's happened to us not what we've been through but your love to define us and I pray that there are people in this room today they would they would make an intentional decision today to be emotionally healthy that they're going to talk with you about the things that really bug them and maybe they need to go to a counselor and talk to somebody or, or maybe they need to start reading some things to help them understand deal with it. But God, I pray for emotional and spiritual health to fill this place and let your view of us, let your view of us overwhelm our view of us so that we can deal with it. With your head still bowed, I want to ask one question. And that one question I want to ask you is this, are you in this room today and God loves you and right now you, you've never received that self-love. You've never received his love for you. And I want to invite you today to receive the love of God for you. I want to invite you to receive that and to make Jesus your Lord and Savior for you to confess him as Lord. Because if you really believe he loves you, then you'll give him your life and you'll trust him. 
and you're in this room today and today is your day to receive the love of Jesus Christ, I want to make that offer to you right now. If you're in this room, you want to receive that love of Jesus, would you just lift your hand really high? I want to pray with you. Yes. Yes, all around this room. Could we all pray together? Could we all pray together? Everybody pray together out loud. All right, y'all ready? Dear God, I believe you love me. I receive that love. Help me grow in your love more and more so that I would have the right view of myself in this world. Help me to love you back. Thank you. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, you stepped into God's love. You stepped into God's love. Come on, let's live it out this week, would you? All right. Um, we get baptism. If you want to, maybe you've never taken the next step of walking in God's love and you want to be baptized, Pastor Robin's going to be right over here to talk to you. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers. Have a great day.